Come check it out, baby. Make it hot, baby. Bring the drum here. Hashtag the basement floor is real. My name's Dave Ken. Of course, I'm your host throughout this venture. And this evening, I've got a very, very, extremely, extremely special guest on the line. Um, she's coming straight out of California here in the hashtag basement floor is real, ladies and gentlemen. Please put your hands together for my person, your person, Robin Lee, ladies and gentlemen. Robin, are you there? I'm here. I'm here. Robin, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. I'm doing quite well this evening. How are you? I'm good. I am so uh, grateful and fortunate and thankful to have you on the hashtag Basement Flow is Real. Um, we've been wanting to... We wanted to get someone like you uh, for a while because we wanted to talk to, we got a lot of people that have come out of this Greenberg, Hartsdale, Westchester County area that are doing some big things and we wanted to really talk about some of that stuff. Oh, great. So, okay, so here's my introduction to you, right? I, I um, you know, I went to Woodlands High School back, back several, several years ago and I had a friend there named Kelly Lee and we mm -hmm. went to the STEP program together. We did a, you know, a whole bunch of stuff together and, you know, she had some house parties a few house parties that that I was privy uh, privy to be around, and I don't know if I ever saw you there, but I know I saw pictures and stuff, and so you know I I don't you know I'm just seeing stuff and just keeping it going. And back in 2003, as we fast forward, I'm watching this movie in the movie theater called uh, Deliberous from Eva, uh, yeah. and I see this young lady in the movie, and I said, man, that young lady looks familiar. And I'm saying, how do I know her? And then I'm saying to myself, well, I, I, how could I know her? <laughs> I, I haven't been to Hollywood. I, how how would I know her? Um, fast forward that a few more years and I get on Facebook, social media and Kelly and I become friends. And then I see these pictures with her and this young lady. I said, that's the, that's the young lady I saw in that movie. And it turns out that it's you, that you're actually a, an actress in Hollywood and you've been in this movie. Is that correct? That's true. I, that's true. How did that work out for you? What, what brought that about? Oh goodness. It's such a, oh, I'm starting to get the roundabout way. How do I get to deliver from Eva from, from leaving, from leaving Woodlands High School? Um, <laughs> right after college, I went to college on the East Coast. I went to Yale in Connecticut. Right. And right after college, I moved to New York. I started acting. I was acting the same time that I was in law school. I did the very first project I booked was this tiny little independent film called Have Plenty. And it was picked up by Miramax. Um, and it came out while my first year in law school, and then I finished law school, took the bar, moved to L.A., and haven't looked back. And I think the second film I did when I got to L.A. was Deliver Us From Eva. Mm. Is it, is it, um, now listen, for, for the viewership that's out there, we see, you know, movies and, and, you know, it, it all looks easy from where, from where we sit, you know, it looks like just it's fun and, you know, you just go in. I mean, what is, what is that process like when you're, you're going in for a role, um, you're, there's obviously several, several people that are, that are, that are either auditioning for the role or you're getting called in. Um, and, right. and I'm, obviously they're calling other people. What is that process like? Is it, is it as easy or fun as it looks, or is it really like a grind and, and, you know, something that you don't necessarily know if you're going to get or not until you get it? It's, it's, it can be both. I mean, I feel like each project is different. We, we, as an actor, you've got a lot of auditions that you don't get. And mm -hmm. there's a lot of rejection, a lot of disappointment, a lot of, you know, really kind of getting your hopes dash or your dreams thrown out and um and you kind of you you can kind of roll with the punches you can let it affect you personally each single one or you can roll with the punches and say well you know what i've got to brush myself off and get ready and, and go out for the next one and, and see what happens um and with some projects you have a good feeling right away you click in the room with the casting director or the director or the producers whoever is there and you, you can tell that they really like you they bring you back another time, maybe one more time, and then you, you book it. And others, you can go in a, several times and not get it, or you can have a great experience in the room and, and never go back. They just, you know, it just went in a completely different direction. Right. So it's kind of, you can't ever really get your hopes up until until you hear the word action, until you're on set. And even then, because you can so easily be edited out of something. So it's not, it's not I would not say it's easy. Um, and for some people, auditioning can be fun. I think in the beginning of your career, it's always fun because it's like practice and it's play and it's the only way you get to really act. Sure. But if you've been doing it for a while, it can be very frustrating and infuriating at times because it's, you know, you, you, you don't know. You just don't know. And a lot of times you, 
go into a room and they've already decided before you open your mouth that you're not the right person for it. And they won't tell you that, but you can kind of see it on, you can read it on their faces. They had someone else in mind and you were not the person. And, you know, you've done all your homework, you've done, you've, you're off book, you've rehearsed, you've worked as a coach perhaps, you've gotten yourself a babysitter maybe, you've driven sure. an hour, you get your hair, your makeup, you show up, and then, you know, within the first 20 seconds, you can feel from, from the people in the room that you're not the right person, <laughs> and it can be very heartbreaking. Now, when, so. when you've been doing it for a while, because you, you've been doing this for a while, um, and, you've been, and you've been very successful at it, uh, you've actually got another movie uh, that, that's, that's out now. Um, tell us a little bit about that. I am in Fifty Shades Darker, mm. which is the second film in the franchise, the Fifty Shades franchise. I'm actually in the third film as well, Fifty Shades Freed, which will be out next year at the same time around Valentine's Day. But uh, Fifty Shades Darker uh, just opened, and I play the COO of Christian Gray's company. I play a character by the name of Roz Bailey, mm. um, and it, it's been a great ride. I mean, it's, I don't think I've ever been, I know I've never been a part of such a large franchise. It's such a well-recognized, well-renowned um, story with such a huge fan base. I mean, the, our fandom is incredible and intense and loving and adoring and welcoming. And it's, it's amazing to, to kind of step into a, a project that's already been in existence and has right. like a reputation and a history and this fan base kind of step into, into it and have them welcome you and become a part of that world is, is, is kind of magical, I guess. I guess. Now, I let, me, let me ask you this, because that, that's obviously a major uh, movie. It was major uh, a, a year ago. What is the process like when you're, when you're, do you feel, is there a certain amount of pressure that maybe goes on to, you know, getting the scene right, getting the, the lines right, or, or is it is it kind of, you know, is it very embracing? Does everyone kind of embrace you into it and it becomes part of the family and the process, you know, it kind of goes in sequence. Is there any added pressure in situations like that versus um, other movies or not so much? You know what, I've been acting long enough. I don't, I, I don't really question my talent, so I don't put my pressure on myself in that way. Like, oh, I can't, I'm not up to par for this mm -hmm. part. Um, you want to look really good. So there's a lot of getting in shape beforehand because you know a lot of people are going to see this and have an expectation of what these characters should be. Right. Uh, but I, I didn't feel the pressure like acting wise. And when you're working on such a big project like this, you, and you have the money, you're, you're going to get the time to play in front of the camera. You know, it's not like doing a little independent film where we have to, you, you're cramming so many um, scenes into one day shoot. So you can only shoot every scene like once or twice. Like, we shot a scene, you know, we shoot a scene, like I might get 24 takes or something crazy like that, you know what I mean? Right, so you have right. time to play and mess up if you mess up or whatever. But I'm, I, I'm a professional and I, I'm always prepared. I'm always off book. I'm, I'm ready. When I'm, when I show up on set, I'm ready. I'm not messing around. Now, let so. me, let me ask you this. I, I had Matt Jackson on here, who's a producer out there in, mm -hmm. in Hollywood, uh, Woodlands High School graduate. And uh, he gave us the take from a from a producer standpoint, um, you know, of, of people being ready and being prepared. And, uh, you know, obviously he couldn't speak to it to an actor or actress's standpoint. But um, what you know, do, is there do you ever get in these situations and it, it, when, when, when it's time to show up and, and everything's a go, is most of the cast and everyone kind of on the same page? Or is there, you know, some competition or some competitiveness between you know, maybe one one trying to outshine each other. You know, we hear these stories about Hollywood and 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 how it is in, in an acting sense. Is is there is there more of a camaraderie in terms of the actual film, or is there a little bit of some extra stuff? I where it, go I ahead. think it depends on each project. I think that's like a three part question you're asking me. Um, I don't think I've ever been in a film where someone was trying to outshine the others. There are mm -hmm. definitely times that you're in a film and there's a much larger, bigger star and you're aware that person's a star, but they're not trying to outshine you. You know what I mean? Got they're, it. They, they just come with their entire entourage and everything. You're not really worried about like pulling attention away from them or vice versa. Mm -hmm. um, I've definitely been in projects where people, some people are not as prepared as others, but for the most part, I've been really lucky to have always, to, to, for, for the most part, be working with professionals who come prepared, know their lines, have done their homework, have done research about their character, have made specific choices. Like I've been, I've been lucky in that respect. It's rare that you 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 work with someone who's like a complete novice. And then I've worked with like kids, you know, and so kids make mistakes. Right. And that's 
kind of natural and you kind of know what you're getting into. And so it's going to be a longer day. You're going to have to take more takes, you know what I mean? Like sure. this, and you just kind of like, you have to be flexible with it and not lose your cool because you're, you're, you're opposite a kid. Um, but adults for the most part are pretty on point. They know the people who, who have been in this for a while are good at what they do. They want to be here. They take it seriously. And those are people I've been lucky to work with for the most part. And you've been in a host of movie. Can you host of movies and, and shows? Can you tell some of the viewership, some of the, uh, the projects that you've been involved with throughout the years? Um, let's see. I did national security with Steve Martin. Uh, Steve Martin. Woo. Sorry. <laughs> 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 and Martin Lawrence. <laughs> I've never made that mistake. Martin Lawrence and Steve Zahn. I did. Um, yes. Uh, it was called National Security and I did Deliver from Eva with Gabrielle Union and LL Cool, cool J I did 13 Going on 30 with Jennifer Garner and Mark Ruffalo I did Hitch with Will Smith and Eva Mendez I did uh, 7 Pounds also with Will Smith I did Hotel for Dogs with Don Cheadle I done a bunch of projects did I've done a bunch of projects. It was just film. TV-wise, I did Being Mary Jane, also with Gabrielle Union. I did um, Tyler Perry's House of Pain. I've done guest stars and everything from Buffy the Vampire Slayer to Numbers. Um, what else have I done? I've done a ton of independent films. I did Miss Dial, which I also co-produced. I saw that. I produced. Mm -hmm. I did This Is Not a Test with uh, Hill Harper and Tom Arnold, which I also produced. I did... I mentioned Half Plenty was the first film I did. Um, it was Chris Giroux's debut project. You got a resume. I've you, got a resume. You got a bunch I'm of resumes. Like, and I'm not even looking at IMDb. I'm just kind of remembering things off the top of my head. Robin, let me I'm ask sure you this. I'm, is, I'm sure I'm forgetting important things. That's all right. Um, is, there, is there a I did difference? I Park, which was uh, another little indie film that came out uh -huh. last year. I did, I've done some movies that have gone straight to television, like The Under Shepherd, which I did with Russ Parr's show, I did with Isaiah Washington and Melinda Williams, and um, Elise Neal and Lamont Rucker. Uh, goodness. That's a bunch of stuff. It's a bunch of stuff, yeah. Let me ask you this, Robin. Is there a difference? Um, Mary, first of all, shout out to the Mary Jane um, series. I, I, I watched that. I like that. It's a very good series, and I remember you from the, from the first season. Is there a difference... And what you do from a motion picture movie to a a series, uh, you know, on a, a BT series or a sitcom versus something that's maybe uh, straight to DVD. Is the same process involved or is there a, a difference in how you approach the project between, you know, what, what it may be that you're that you're actually engaging in? I like to think I, I approach all my projects similarly, like I take them seriously. I don't. I'm not sloppy about something if I think if it's, a, if it's a smaller budget and I think it's going to get less attention, whatever. I'm not going to show up and just do, you know, like half the work. Right, right. I'm going to give it 100% every single time. It's a different, it's different in the way that uh, you have these certain, like, luxuries when you're on a bigger project, a bigger budget project. You might have a bigger trailer. You might stay in a nicer hotel. You've got better um, wardrobe and hair and makeup and, you know, space and time. Time is really the essence when they can give you, like I was saying, like when you're doing a bigger project thing and you can, you have the opportunity to make mistakes and play with it and try things over and over again, as opposed to if you're doing a tiny indie and you've got to get everything kind of in, in a short period of time. And that's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it sounds like it's a, it's a process out there that you gotta be, you gotta be really in sync and everything with, and you've obviously done a great job. I've seen a bunch of your movies, um, big fan of the stuff that you do. Um, let me ask you this, if, if you don't mind, how do you, you know, being a female, um, African American female and Jamaican, you, you, you have, uh, you're, you're Jamaican. Is yeah. there, do you find that there is a disparity maybe between the roles or the segments that you may, that, that may come your way, uh, because of that? Or do you think that, you know, in, in, in that, in that genre, it's, it's really all the same. It's all in, in kind of an even playing field and. No, it's absolutely different. It's absolutely different. There's, there's just less opportunity for women of color and that's not just black women that's asian women that's latina women that's for sure native american women there are fewer roles being written for us because you know hollywood is the kind of there's a lot of nepotism and you hire the people you're familiar with so you hire your friends and you hire what you know and it, it's predominantly white men running this business and so there, there's just less opportunity for women there's less opportunity for people of color and there's much less opportunity for women of color. And the people who they're hiring to write are 
typically white men who are writing for white men, and so you get there are just fewer parts when they do go out of their way to to try to add some diversity in a television show, let's say. Um, then it's only going to be certain things. Like, let's say it's going to be an ensemble cast. If we've got a black man, then we're not going to get a black woman, too. We're going to get a thrown an Asian woman, let's say, or a Latina mm. woman. You know what I'm saying? So it can be right. like three white people and a black and an Asian, but we're going to have to mix it up or whatever it is. Um, is it changing? Yes. I, I mean, I always say it's taking, it's taking forever. Right now, we're in, a, we're in a really great place where there's a lot of great TV for black people. I mean, with, with black characters, there's great Asian TV. There's Aziz Ansari and there's like Fresh Off the Boat, but there's also Blackish and Empire and, and Being Mary Jane and things like that. Right. Um, power. I mean, but those, I mean, I feel like we're in a, we're in a really great spot right now. now you... It's taken a long time to get here and it can always easily go away, you know? I mean, right. even with film, we had like a couple of years of Oscar So White and then this year has been like this epiphany of great black films out there, like Hidden Figures and Fences and right. Moonlight and like, you know, and, and a range of, of work for us. But in general, those parts are few and far between and they're going to go to the bigger names. They're, they're going to go to the Violas or the Tarajis or the Carries or... Well, let me ask you this. That, 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 that brings up a very good point because, um, you know, from 10,000 feet, which is where I said I'm not I'm not in the Hollywood segment. But <laughs> a few years ago, we had the, the Oscars. It may, I say a few years ago. It may have been a year or so ago where Jada Pinkett um, didn't didn't want she expressed public uh, concern with the right. uh, Oscar so white. Okay. And there right. was this big. Yes. I think it was last year that she did that. Yeah. And there was there appeared to be some backlash. And before that, you know, going back into the late 90s, maybe early millennium, it seemed like there was a plethora of. Of, uh, of black movies at that time. You had the what, best you know, man. When and... I first got in, involved in this business, when I first started this business, I felt like there there was, like the early 90s when we had things like She's Gotta Have It and Men's Society and Boys in the Hood. And there were all these young black filmmakers coming up. There were the Hughes Brothers and, and John Singleton and Spike. And like, it felt like there was so much out there. Right. And then we went through a period where it just kind of like, it just all went away. <laughs> I told you for years it was nothing but Tyler Perry, and like it all just dried up, and it's starting to come back. What what happened um, though? What what do you think happened? What do you what do you attribute it from just from being in in in, in that you know in that tight knit? What do you see as as happening? Because there there was a lot of John Singleton, Spike Lee, Matty Rich. What? Um, you know, I, and I, I want to say it was a writer strike, but that was in two thousand eight. So I feel like that was even a little bit later, and the writer strike definitely changed things for everyone, not just people of color, because there was a period when these films were not being made, and so all the bigger actors were start, started doing television, and so television kind of started getting better, and better writers were working on TV, and then actors wanted those meaty roles, and so that's when we started having things like Mad Men, or like House of Cards, whatever, all these great shows started showing up on television. I don't know what happened. I really don't know. I don't know how it all fell off. Right. I would say that it, it did start falling, like... I would say, like, by the late 90s, early 2000s, it, it kind of dried up for a while. And it really was. It was really, like, just Tyler Perry, because it was, I can't, I can't even think of any, like, little indies, like, gritty films. Like, remember, I made, like, Love Jones, like, all those things, like, yeah. they just disappeared. Yeah, you had Inkwell, Love Jones, um, yeah. a bunch of shows, and they just kind of, you know, we, we turned into Medea, and then we didn't see anything, and it was Medea for, like, right. a few years. Right. And, I mean, God loves Tyler Perry. He kept all of us continue to get health insurance because single-handedly because of Tyler Perry. Because he had enough projects that he was putting us all in. And, and that was great. But, yeah, there, was, there, there wasn't very much else. Like, there, there just was... I'm trying to think of great black indies even at that time, and I cannot think of any of them, which is... A shame. Well, it was a it was a rough stretch, and hopefully that's coming back. We're going to take a quick commercial break, and when we come back, I want to go over um, with you, Robin, some of the stuff that maybe inspired you um, as a youth coming into this into this field. So we'll be right back. Hashtag Basement Floors Real Dave Tanner here with Robin Lee. We'll be right back. Hashtag Basement Floor is real. My name's Dave Cannon. Of course, I'm back 
and my guest this evening, the lovely Robin Lee. Robin, uh, coming out of Westchester County, um, Greenberg, um, which, which by the way, I didn't know. Shout out to All County Kev. I did not know that uh, all of this place was Greenberg, but but you know he's got this Greenberg Untold coming in the future. Um, how did that? What what brought you to this point? As as a you know as a young lady in Woodlands High School, which is in Hartsdale, did you see yourself becoming an actress? At what point did you say, "Hey, I, I want to get into the entertainment field in, in this in this regard, and I, and I think I can be successful in it." You know, Dave, I've wanted to act since I could speak, like since I was two years old. I remember being very very like clear memory of being maybe two or three years old and wondering how people got into the TV. And then, like, this is back in the day before flat screens when they had, like, you know, when she was, like, a box. <laughs> right, right. And I remember going around the box of the TV and looking at the back and wondering how those people got in there and begging my parents to let me do it and let me be on it. And when I was, on, when I was four, I, got a, I did a little quick guest star or whatever it was, it was on Romper Room, and it was, like, a taste of it. And I so, like, I loved it. My parents were immigrants or Jamaican and very strict and very much, you know, we didn't move to this country for you to become an actress. You're, you're going to go to school. You're going to do well. You're going to get your education. Um, and so they allowed me to do little um, school plays and so forth. And I did like regional, like I did a little community theater in Westchester, but they were really against me doing it professionally. And I don't think they even would have known how to get into the business. Like I used to write letters myself to like the casting director or well, not even casting directors. I think at that point I, I just, <laughs> I used to write letters to like the head of NBC and to like, how can I be on the facts of life in different strokes? <laughs> like I get these form letters back. Like this is not exactly how this is done. Um, but then I went to Yale for undergrad and then the car ride up to New Haven, my dad said, don't think we're sending you to Yale to study drama. Mm. And so I, was a psychology major and it wasn't until I came out that I thought, you know what, okay, it's now it's now or never, it's do or die. And even then, they them being Jamaican, <laughs> like one degree was not enough for them. And so I had to make a deal with my parents that I would I could crack I could study acting in New York if I applied to law school. And so I applied and went to Columbia in New York in Manhattan and, and I was acting the entire time simultaneously. Right. And um I it kind of it's the two things I've always loved doing were writing and acting. And I mean, I feel like when I think about what my life is today, I kind of feel there's a, I have this kind of like a peace in knowing that I've, I've honored my dreams. You know what I mean? Like yeah. these are the interests that I've had since I, I, since I can remember. And I still feel very passionately about this. I kind of feel like I, I know who I am. I'm being true to who, what I want to do and what I want out of life. And so it's kind of, it's just a huge part of me, and I think that for a lot of artists, like if you're not, if you can't find a way to express yourself, you can very quickly become depressed. And I think you know that, like you know what it is that that makes you that way. And not all people are like that, but, but a lot of artists are. Now, so. Matt Matt Jackson mentioned that when he was, you know, when he finished college, he got on a train and he took, I guess, it's a five day uh, train ride to California and didn't really know what he was going to do when he got there and was just hoping he was going to land something. I'm paraphrasing something to that effect. Right. Is, is that the story? You know, well, first, it's a two it's a two part question. First, is that the story that that you uh, embarked on and 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 I, and I hear that story a lot and secondly is that story a reality today in 2017 is it something that someone can just kind of go to hollywood la los angeles california and and you know make something happen has the business changed uh from today's standpoint from from you know back in the late late 90s that's not my story i mean i started doing it in new york i, I started by doing by studying in New York with a great acting coach. I'm doing theater in New York and then commercials and tiny little independent films. And then I started getting seen more and more for TV and studio films and was putting things on tape constantly for, for projects in LA. And then eventually when I was done with law school, I decided it was, I was going to give LA a shot and come out here and just be here for maybe two years, maybe five years. And it's been way more than that. And I'm still here. Right. <laughs> um, so that's my journey, but I feel like now even more than ever, that can be the model that works. Because if you come out here and you've got ideas, it is so much easier now to get a group of friends together and get your iPhone 6 or whatever, 7 or whatever it is, and shoot your little film 
write your project, shoot your film, edit it yourself, upload it onto YouTube, and start getting recognition. Like, you don't have to wait to get an agent or whatever or to book something to get a reel. Like, it's easier and easier now to get yourself out there because we have the technology to just, like, make our own little films. And so many stars are, are getting that start their start that way and just making their own projects. So I think in that respect, it's even more accessible now. You know, I, I've, you I've have, heard that. You don't that. have to go to the traditional channels. I've heard that. So do you think that social media, things like YouTube um, and, and various situations where you can now record a lot of stuff, do you think that that really puts people today that much ahead of the curb? Or is there still a marketing, you know, do you still have to kind of know someone? Do you still have to kind of have no, X I amount of followers? I think I think there's probably a couple ways of doing it. But I think that you can go to a great conservatory like Yale or Juilliard or NYU or someplace where casting directors are going to come out and see you and then you're going to land an agent or agents are going to come out and you're going to land an agent and you can go the traditional route or you can do do what I just said and, and just make yourself a tiny little film and build yourself up from there and build yourself a fan base. Start your own YouTube channel and get enough followers that, that you can reach out and be like, I have this many followers, these are how many hits I have, blah, 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 this is who I am, this is my following, this is how many Twitter followers I have. And it's really kind of scary <laughs> but that but you can do it that way now right you can totally do it that way and i mean i think younger people are doing that i think it's it's more confusing for older people who don't want <laughs> to do it that way like it's like oh, i've been doing this for so long now i have to like you know but like teaching an old dog new tricks like do i really want to make go and make shoot my own thing and then edit it and then upload it and whatever and be doing social media and so forth i mean for some older actors they don't they don't want to do that like this is has always worked for them. They don't want to mess with the with something that works. But um, the younger generation is coming up and doing that. So, are you noticing, or do you do? You, is there a difference between the uh, actors or actresses of our generation um, versus the actors and the actresses of the coming generation? Where you know, because the, you know, some they may not have had to go through some of the same. Um, I don't want to say tangibles, but some of the same processes that some someone like yourself, someone like a Gabriel Union, someone that a lot of the other people that are pillars that have gotten to the point that they've gotten right. to in this year. Is there a difference in how they are looked, viewed, or is it is it overly embracing? I mean, there, there may not be that many roles available, as you mentioned earlier. Is there kind of a fight to the fittest in terms of com competitive, or is everyone kind of embracing and letting the cards kind of go where no, they go? I mean, I think that I think there's something to be said for actors who are classically trained or who are good, just naturally really good, versus actors, quote unquote, actors who just have a huge social media gathering and are able to book things because people want to help you. People or filmmakers or producers want to use their social media, that social media platform or their audience to help sell tickets. You know what I mean? Like if you, if if the director says action and you can't act, you can't act. Right. <laughs> And that's great that you can get butts in the seat and you can sell tickets, but if you're not very good, people on set are aware of that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, right. Will, so will they overlook that, though? You will, get yourself, I, I mean... Will directors they'll, overlook they might that? Look at, look at to, book, to book you, but, you know, I don't... I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I don't miss out on... I don't miss things like that. I see right. I can see it on the screen. I can see when they can cut around a bad performance. They're giving parts to people who are famous for, like, their reality TV gigs or whatever. I mean, look, we just gave away the presidency <laughs> someone from a reality show. So, you know, you can ride this all the way to the White House. Right, you can. Say, so but it true. doesn't mean you're good at it. There you go. <laughs> Uh, that is that is that is very uh that's very powerful uh what you just said there because that, there's really a lot of validity and, and truth into that um do you feel in hollywood is the the camaraderie ar among actors and actresses based on their genre for example a denzel washington a, a kevin costler an older generation um actor versus uh generation x our generation actor versus a millennium someone who's just you know kind of coming right. into this thing are there Type are they typecast, or, and are, is there resentment by any of that, or is it you know not really um, that? It's just the the role comes how it comes. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. If it's, I don't know if it's resentment. I think it's important to know your craft and know the history, know your business, and know the history of it, so that you have respect for the people who've come before you. Mm. You know, you don't want to disrespect a Cicely Tyson 
sure. or even younger, like Alfred Woodard or, or Angela Bassett or something, you know, these actresses who've been around for 20 years and doing solidly or 30 years and doing solidly great work, you don't want to show up on set and not have an idea of who these people are and what their credits are and their journey. Because mm-hmm. these people came before you and shaped this business. Um, I think anytime you're disrespectful of that, it's not a good thing. Yeah. I, I can't speak for how older actors look at younger actors. I think, I don't think it's some, I don't think it's just one perspective, one point of view. I think people bring to the game different levels of baggage or, sure, or sure. you know, their ideas about, about it. You know what I mean? I think it's harder if you're, I don't know. I don't know. It depends how old you are. It depends the success you've had. It depends the journey you've had and whether or not you're happy with the work you've done. Right. And, or, the, or the work you did at that age, even, before you start looking at younger actors and, and begrudging them their successes, you know what I mean? Sure, sure. But I think, no matter what, you have respect. I, I think all actors have respect for real talent when they see talent. Right. right. Um, and they're going to respect that more than just be- youth or beauty or social media followers. Robin, what... And I think, and I think it pays to know, like I said, know the journey of the people you're working with and the actors you're working with and what they've done, and and have some respect for their experiences and, and what what it took for them to get to where they are, especially coming up at the time they did. Right. It's it's not it's it's never easy. Um, what are what are some of the challenges that you know that being a veteran in, in the in the business as you have that you that you may face in in today's 2017 are there any you know challenges as an actress that has an extensive resume such as yourself that you may encounter or is it really just the way the parts come and how they come you know if it's if it's the part it's the part and, and you get and you get it or or are there are is there things that you've had to tweak in in your in your game as the as the time has changed as, as times have changed um it takes more when you get older to look good. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot more time spent at the gym, I guess. I don't know. I kind of feel like you have to you have to be easy on yourself. I mean, the people I came up with are still all my age, and I'm up against, for the most part, I'm up against the same people I've been up against for 20 years. Right. And if you do this long enough, you make a lot of friends. And so I like I like going into a, a waiting room and seeing all my friends, you know what I mean? Like right. women that I've, I've been seeing for years. I feel like, well, I'm in the right place, but I don't. Are you guys competing? Are you, are you guys competing? You know, is it, is it that scarce, uh, scarce in some regards that you may, may be competing for that? Well, against my friends for yeah. sure. But then, you, but, but then you want, if you don't, if you don't get it, you want your best friend to get it as opposed to somebody okay. else who just came out of nowhere. <laughs> you right. know what I mean? Like, right. Right. I hope it goes to so-and-so cause I know her and love her and I know she's talented. I know she works hard and whatever, but also it, it you also, when you've been doing it long enough and you know the people you're up against, like you can get a, an audition and see the role and be like, oh yeah, this this part's perfect for her. She's gonna get it. Why am I, Why are they even seeing me? You know what I mean? Like or be, or no, I'm better for this role than this girl, this girl, and this girl, or this woman, this woman. You know what I'm saying? Right. Because you know their work and you know their range. And, and listen, doing this as long as you have, you you've also branched out into several several other things. You you you've actually got a book that's um. On, on its way or out right now, and it, it, the idea of you. The idea of you. It comes out on June thirteenth, June thirteenth by St. Martin's Press, um, and it is. I'm really, really excited about it. It's my first novel. What brought that about? Um, you know, I've always written for myself. I've always done it for pleasure, and there's something about being an an artist where I feel like I need to be creating just for peace of mind and with acting you're you're waiting for permission for someone for you're waiting to, for someone to give you permission to create mm. you know you can't just you could just go and stand on a street corner and perform Shakespeare soliloquies but people would think you're crazy <laughs> <laughs> or or you could do it in the New York subway and, and get money for it but for the most part it's a collaborative experience and, and you're waiting for someone else to give you permission you're waiting for a writer or a producer or whatever to choose you and then you're working with all the other people whatever and I feel like writing is something I can do on my own. I can sit down and do it anywhere at any time of day and have something to show for at the end of the day. And so it's what I kind of do for my peace of mind and to like to feed me and and feed my me creatively. And so I've always done it um, 
for myself. And a few years ago, I, I, I came up with this idea for this book, and it happened really relatively quickly. I wrote the entire novel within about a year and a half. Wow. And sold it, and it's coming out in June. And literally, I, it's, it's having been three years since I started writing it. Now listen, I, 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 you know, I looked at a little bit of, of information like, about this, um, and so yeah. you've got here a a, a, a mother um, who's, okay. I guess, taking uh, her. I was it's a thirty-nine-year-old. Yes. Celine Marchand is is the, the protagonist. She's thirty-nine. She's this sophisticated, um, divorced woman living in Los Angeles. She owns an art gallery. She has a twelve-year-old daughter. Um, and the daughter is obsessed with this British boy band. And the mother takes the daughter to meet the boy band to a concert and the meet and greet with the band. And one of the guys in the band falls for the mom. And mm. he's 20. Mm. And they embark on this very um, intense, genuine relationship that kind of uncovers all these things about her and the underbelly of fame and celebrity. Um, and it, she just deals with all these challenges and has to make choices that she did not expect having to make. Now, Robert, where does that come from? Where, how do you, I mean, cause this is very creative because it's something, you know, very unique. Did, did you just, you know, are you just sitting, sitting around and kind of thinking <laughs> things and this <laughs> kind of comes up? up, you know, <laughs> I have many ways of spitting this story, but, the, but the, uh, the truth is that I was up late on a Monday night or Tuesday night. My husband was away on business, and I was surfing like YouTube and came across this one kid, let's say, in a band on a music video who was so cute, but so young, like so obviously young, and I started researching and figured out how old he was. And um, like two days later, my husband came back into town and I told him, I was like, oh, I found this guy. I, and I was like, and he's 20. I'm thinking about leaving you and the kids and just running off with a 20-year-old in a boy band. What would you do if I did that? As a joke, obviously. Right, right. I have a great relationship. And, <laughs> and Eric, my husband, said, he was like, you're crazy. And he paused and he goes, but that would make a great book. Hmm. And I said, wow, he's totally right. Like, that would make a great story. And I could write that story because I know what it's like to be turning 40 and kind of like, you know, dealing with all these issues of motherhood, but then also dealing with getting older and your sexuality and feeling more and more invisible, especially in the industry that I'm in. Sure. Um, and I had some experiences um, when I was first, in, when I was in college and right out of college, I was, I managed a singing group with a girlfriend of mine and we had one of the new kids on the block producing for our band our group so I knew kind of what that boy band life was like like I'd seen it up you know, close and I'd seen the craziness of their fans and the frenzy of just their lives and the chaos and and then also seeing who they were out of the spotlight you uh. know as real people and so I knew that I knew I was familiar with boy bands, I was familiar with that level of celebrity. I'd been, I've been around that level of celebrity for the past 20 years and I knew I could write it and I knew I could, I would enjoy it. It would be fun. It would be a nice departure from, from, you know, just worrying about where my next acting job. Sure. I tell you what, ladies so, and gentlemen, we've got a lot of stuff here. Robin Lee is dropping jewels right now. We'll be right back. We're going to take a quick commercial back and we'll be right back here with Hashtag Base Tools Drill. My name is Dave Cannon. Robin Lee, we'll be right back. Hashtag Basement Floor is real. My name is Dave Cannon. I am back with the lovely Robin Lee. Robin, I just want to clear a rumor. I just want to clear the air on something here and clear a rumor. The young lady, the, the Trinidadian lady, Jamaican lady in the shirt from the 70s that says Jamaica, is she? Is it true that she's a relative of yours? No, she's not. She, she's not a relative of yours? <laughs> That's so funny. No, although we had that picture in our family room hanging above the bar. This is back in the day when we had like paneling. 
and like wood panels on the walls in the 80s we had that picture up in our in our house for years and years i guess i guess if you were to visit you would think it was like a family photo but no it's not listen your your, your, your sister the lovely kelly lee has posted that picture as as a, a pic in one of our various chats at one point i said you know i wonder I if they're related just remind us of our childhood but it's not okay it's not um, so listen, it's 2017. Um, you've done it all. You've done uh, you've done books. Uh, you've written screenplay. You have uh, been you you've been in movies. You've worked with some of the greatest uh, players in in Hollywood. What's next for Robin Lee? What do you, what is it that what what do you see the next five or six years for yourself? Oh my goodness. Um, oh, I don't know. I would love for the idea of you to be a huge success. Um, I would love to option it as a film. I would love to write the screenplay, which I'm doing now. I would love to be a producer on it and see how that experience is. Um, and, a, and a big budget project, not, not just a small indie. Right. Um, and I'd love to continue to write and create. Like I, I feel that you're kind of limited in this business a little bit. You can be limited until you have power or you have your own means of making projects. You're kind of limited by the parts that you're given, the parts that you think people think you're right for, and the par parts people see you as. And I feel like as a writer, I can create worlds and characters and roles that are beyond my physicality. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes perfect sense. And so I've done that with this book. Like I've got British characters, I've got French characters, I've got Ethiopian characters. Um, I have this full gamut. It's not just it's not just Jamaican, black Jamaican girl in America. You know what I mean? Like, right. and I can write for all these people and inhabit these bodies as I write in a way that I can't do as an actor. Um, and that gives me a kind of freedom. And I want to continue to do that. Like, I'm working on another novel now. I'm still in the early parts of it. But I, I like being able to step into these different worlds and explore them in that way and not feel limited by like what I look like physically and and someone saying you can't play this role this is not for you this is whatever and I like being able to do all of that and I'd like to continue to do that and if it means I'm writing projects for people who might necessarily look like me then that's fine but at least I've been able to kind of live in that world in my head and express it and that, that gives me a, a certain feeling of power let me ask you this um, because this 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 was noted recently, especially with the uh, the, the recent presidential um, debates, it mm -hmm. th there there are there appears to be at least from what analysts and people say from the outside that there may be a disparity between what females will make and what males will make in in said industries, whether it's entertainment or otherwise. There there right. appears to be a difference yeah. between what said uh, Caucasians people will make versus said African Americans will make in in said industries. Being in the industry that you're in, is that something that you see as maybe balancing out in the future, or and is there a reason for that? Is there, you know, um, no. <laughs> I mean, I feel like <laughs> no. I mean, until women are making the same as men. But even when that happens, it doesn't mean that black women are going to make the same as white men. I mean, I, I, is that going to happen in my lifetime? I don't know. Are there anomalies? Absolutely. I can think of at least five black women who are making way more than some white men in Hollywood. Right. For sure. People like, let's say, Shonda Rhimes or Oprah. I mean, yes, that does exist. Right, right. But for the most part, no. What what has to happen? What what like what do you, from from actually being in it? What do you see as is it like what is the sellable feat for them? Is it that oh, well the experience is different or the the character like what would be the rationale that would perceive that says what, Holly, what Hollywood likes to tell you is that your your value to them is is your box office and so it's how many tickets they think they can sell because of your likeness because you're associated with the project. And they will tell you that you have a certain box office value in this country. And then they'll also tell you what your box office value is in the world. Mm. And they will tell you that black actors don't sell so well internationally, with the exceptions of, I think for years it was just Will Smith, right? right. Maybe. Was there anyone else? I mean, it wasn't even Denzel because Denzel was doing more drama. But right. it was like, if you did, if you did action, because action films will sell big internationally. They'll hmm. tell you that romantic comedies 
don't sell well internationally or maybe even broad comedies don't sell well because comedy is very culture and language specific. Sure, subjective, so, so right. The jokes that, you know what I mean, that, that yep. translate here might not trans well so well, translate so well in Taiwan or something like that. <laughs> sure. um, they'll say the same thing about drama. So it's, it's action, big blockbuster action comedies can sell well internationally. So if you, if you are The Rock or you are Vin Diesel, then it kind of doesn't matter what color you are because now you're a big star throughout the world and we can pay you a certain amount of money. Right. But if you're just doing gritty drama films and you're and you're a person of color, they're going to argue that you're not they're not gonna make that much money back off of you outside of this market, outside of the North American market. So they don't have to pay you as much. That's very aggressive. That's very aggressive. Um and then they also have a, a very, a very specific ideas about black people in film, right? So you could be Will Smith and be in a movie and be a major, major star. But what I've noticed with Will, like a lot of the formula with him, is that it might be changing now, but for years they wouldn't give him a black wife mm. because then it becomes then they worry it's a black movie, right? So what they could do with Will is they give him the, the black ex-wife or the black dead wife or the black ex-fiance, <laughs> and then they give him a wife that's not going to be. That's going to sell internationally, but not be too um, controversial. That's not going to sell in America. So there was a period when Will would have black ex-wives, but Latina on-screen lovers right. or partners. Interest, right. Because, because Latina is like acceptable, and it's not going to offend people in middle America who don't want to see with a white woman. Mm. But, it's not, but it's not black, so it doesn't look like a black movie. So the, the students come up with like these formulas of what they think is going to work. Like... They have these ideas that America is not going to accept this, or people in England are not going to accept this, or people in Hong Kong are not going to accept this, whatever it is. And, you know, I've read lots of different studies and whatever. I'm not an expert on what works and what doesn't work, but I know that that is often the argument they use for putting certain things together. How, how does... Packaging films the way they package them and, and for what they feel like they can pay their stars. Okay, so that's what they're looking for. Now, let me ask you this. What do you look for in a role? So you get, someone calls you and they say, hey, we want you to, to read for, for this part. What do you look for as a deciding factor? And, and not just yourself also. What, what do you and, and actors, actresses of your genre look towards for a part? Are we looking at, you know, what the financial gain is? Are we looking at what the role is? Things. I mean, I think everyone's in a different place, right? Okay. So often you're looking at bottom line, you're looking at finances, like how much am I going to make on this? Are right. they give, giving me a lot of money or not? And then beyond that, you're looking for, depending on how um, how big the film is, not how big, not blockbuster big, but how noteworthy it is or what the studio is, you're looking at what's the likelihood of this going to a great film festival like Sundance. And from there, what's the likelihood that this could go to award season? So you'll take a huge pay cut if you're going to do a film that's that you know is going to be a tiny little indie that's going to do well at award season or going to go to Sundance and then go and be picked up by, I don't know, right. Focus or whatever. I don't know. Right. Right. Because, but some of us have kids. <laughs> we have tuition to pay. We have mortgages <laughs> to pay. And you kind of just take what you can get. That's not embarrassing. Right. Um, I will do a film for very little money. If, the part is something I haven't played before and it's really challenging and it's gritty and different. Right. Or if it's opposite an actor that I've wanted to work with for a long time or a bunch of actors who I, who I really respect and revere and want to work and know that I can learn from, or it's with a bunch of friends and I'm supporting my friends, you know, and I, and I think that my name will help them get any kind of recognition. I will, I'll be more than happy to jump in if I can. So there's reasons why I'll do something for less money than, what my quote is. That, that brings up a, an interesting perspective. Do do a lot of, do you find that there are people that will maybe do something to to act and be in a performance with someone that they may have wanted to perform with? Or do you find that, you know, maybe that's a little overrated and, you know, like if hypothetically Danzel's in this movie, I mean, what 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 goes through, is that something that really is, is it like, hey, well, who else is in this movie as, as we're going through the process? For sure. I mean, like, that's why you get breakdowns and they, I mean, they, your people will tell you this is a project and so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so are attached. And when you hear those names are attached, you, first of all, you realize how much money might be attached or it depends, it depends if it's already greenlit in the studio or not, right? So if it's right. a little indie and you've got these bigger names attached, you know you're probably going to get picked up. You're probably going to get distribution. If it's already at a big studio and those names are attached, you know you're going to get a certain box office. Right, right. And a certain amount of attention. 
that's why studios are trying to, or studio, any producer is trying to attach the biggest name he can, the biggest talent he can. Right. Interesting stuff. I want to ask you, Robin, um, before we get out of here, I'm going to give you a couple of movies. I want you to tell me what your impression was of these movies. I just, I want to see from the mind of someone that's actually in it, what they, not not in it, literally, but you know, what they think <laughs> right. of these movies. I hope I've seen them all. Okay, but go. <laughs> have, you, have, you, have you seen Fences? I have not seen Fences. Okay, let, for, let's scratch Fences. Forget Scrinch. <laughs> but I've seen the play several times and I've done the play, and so I'm very familiar and I can recite lines from Fences. I haven't seen it yet. Listen, that's but a very engaged. good, it's a conversational piece. I saw it and I really want to get perspective from someone, but we'll we'll move from that. Mm, yeah, I haven't seen it, but you know, I saw like, I saw Angela Bassett and Lawrence Fishburne do it at the Pasadena Playhouse several years ago. Like, I, it's such an incredible play. It's such an incredible August Wilson. It's amazing. And I mean, I'm well aware of what Denzel and Viola are capable of, so I know I'm going to be very, very happy when I do see it. Um, but no, I haven't seen it yet. How about Love and Basketball? Yes, but years ago. I haven't seen it since I think I saw it in the theater. Is that a movie? What does that does that what does that, does that kind of movie say? What does that movie say to you? Does that say like um, storyline? Does it say acting? You know, what does that it was movie? Great. Great, because it was um, it was new faces. I think it was the first time we really saw Sana. Right. And she had a great chemistry with Omar, right? With Omar mm -hmm, Epps mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. Gina Prince Bud. We did a beautiful job of directing a story that we don't typically see. It was nice seeing this kind of relationship where she could be tough but vulnerable. You know what I mean? Like yeah. she could be a guy's kind of girl. You know what I mean? Like, um, it was refreshing and different. And it wasn't, I hate to say it wasn't a hood movie, but it wasn't a hood movie. And we'd come out of a period where we're doing a lot of movies in the hood. I, listen, I completely agree with you. I saw, you know, when I, and, and listen, this is no knock to the future. This is no knock to anything. But when I saw movies like, you know, your higher learnings, your um, menace to society, boys right. in the hood, juice. I mean, those are epic cult classic movies, but you know, there right. needs to be a point where we moved on from that. So I was glad to see movies and listen to the viewership, to the guys out there, I hope I'm not sounding soft, but that's why I love to see movies like love and basketball, best man, love Jones just killed yeah. it for me. Love yeah. Jones was just, do you it's agree with that? Film. Yes, totally. Totally. And I get a lot. I get people who recognize me all the time from half plenty, which is the very first thing I did. And that came out right Maybe right after Love Jones came out, I guess. Yeah, around that yeah, era. Yeah, about a year after Love Jones. Um, and people loved it because it was different and because it wasn't in the hood. And it was like our people in a love story where there was no guns and no violence. And it wasn't about being in the prison system or like overcoming all these atrocities. It was just positive black people living their lives. And it was so like refreshing. It was so sad in a way that that was all <laughs> that mattered that like that 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 reached so many people because it's like oh thank god like why we can't can't we finally just have a story where it's just about two people you know falling in and out of love and it, is that a typecast though is that because it, it did seem like it did seem like from ten thousand feet from a viewer, viewership perspective it did seem like there was a time period that it seemed like blacks being in movies it had to be something violent it had to be something in a hood it had to be something where someone was keeping it real or trying to get right. out did it seem like at that time that there was this industry push that they really wanted people for that because there's there's a clear difference between a boys in the hood and a, and a best man and a love jones and these movies we're, we're talking like three four years apart we're not talking like you know 15 right. years evo like an evolution um, was there, was, did you, did you sense that there was the typecast that they were looking for younger African Americans for in, 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 in certain roles during that time? And what shifted it? What, what maneuvered it to, to where it began? I don't know. I mean, I think it was just these filmmakers getting the opportunity to tell their stories. And, you know, Spike had a certain kind of story he wanted to tell. And he also was, he also came of age of time, came of age in a time where we didn't have that many there weren't that many different stories out there. You know what I mean? Like we'd come off, let's say the seventies and we came off of like, I don't know, shafts and things like that. Right. Um, and then we went into the, oh, what's, what's all those like dance movies of the early eighties and stuff. Right. Right. I'm thinking about. And it was, it was interesting to have a different perspective, a different narrative, but he was also telling stories you know, predominantly about like Brooklyn and like his experiences. Oh, beautiful. And movie. then, and John was coming up telling us stories about like Compton and, and his experiences. And so it was, it was more kind of like these underdog 
experiences that were very true to them and who they were. And it wasn't until more people got their voices, and we saw female filmmakers too, like Gina, um, and the Casey, what, Cassie Lemons who did Eve's Bayou. Right. Is, is that correct? I mean, like, that we could start seeing different perspectives. And I think it was just different black filmmakers saying, we don't all have the same story. We're not like, we have different things that appeal to us. Right. And then it all dried up. <laughs> one, one, one thing I, I say, and I debate with people often in this, is, uh, you know, there, there's, there's, there's a part of the public um, that would say that movies like, uh, not movies, but shows like Empire, for example, are mm -hmm. uh, are detrimental, that they are right. um, cooning or whatever they may right. want to call them, and shows like Blackish. And and this, this is my take, and it may not be a popular take, but my take is if, you know, we, we want to get as many presence, we want to put a presence as often as possible in a film. And as long as we can get a presence that can maneuver to the next, because if Spike Lee doesn't do do the right thing, um, and it doesn't generate w whether it was controversial or not at that time. I don't know that we see it's a conversation, right. right? I don't know that we see John Singleton in you know poetic justice, higher learning. I don't right. know if right. we see some of this stuff. So it takes an empire type movie. It takes a, a power. I don't see these as gimmicks um, or hood movies, but it takes some of these actors that to get. First of all, they get employment. Second of all, the resource. Look at Ice Cube. He did you know Friday. Right. You know, right. But, but I also feel like we're, we are lucky in the way now, especially with, because there's so much cable TV too, and things like Netflix and Amazon, um, that we have options. I mean, there was a period when all we had was the Cosby show. Right. Right? Right. Um, and now we have an array of things. And yes, Empire might be a little dramatic. Right. But if you don't like Empire, you can watch, well, you can watch Scandal, also dramatic, or Power, also dramatic. Right. But still, different characters doing different things, like different narratives, you know what I mean? Different perspectives. Right. There's also the get down. Like, I mean, there, there's, there's a lot, there's a lot going on. There's, um, Luke Cage. Like, you're saying like there's different... Sure, several genres. Several, several. There's several genres. Like, you can be black now and watch and see yourself. <laughs> you can find yourself somewhere on TV. You can be black and watch, you can be black and watch yourself. Watch, you could just... Right, or what's Oprah's, what's Oprah's church show? Green, Greenleaf? Is that what it's called? We got it. We'll, we'll, yeah, we'll figure it. We'll add it in there. But, yeah, I think it's Greenleaf. But, like, there are all these different perspectives, and we didn't have that before. Mm. And it's really kind of refreshing. So I'm okay with there being an empire. Right. Because there are all these other different things out there balancing it. And if you, if Cookie speaks to you and that's what you want to see, tune in and, and put your dollars there. You know what I mean? Like, right. But, but she's not the only thing out there now, and that's, and that's beautiful that we have other things. Robin, I appreciate you um, coming out tonight. Hashtag Basement Flow is real. Is there anything you would like to tell the viewership before we head on out of here? I don't know. Buy my book. And see my movie. <laughs> where can we find Where can we find your book at? What's your website? What's your info that we can we can let the viewership know? Um, you can find it on Amazon. You can find it on Barnes and Noble. You can find it at your whatever independent film. I mean, independent uh, bookseller. Okay. It's called the Idea of You. You can go to Goodreads and you can. Um, follow it, and that way you, you can be take part in our book giveaways that are coming up next month. Um, yeah, and it'll it'll be at a bookstore near you, in a Barnes and Noble or whatever it is bookstore near you, come June. But you can pre-order it now. Please, if you're listening to this right here, please go out there and pre-order this. Let's support. This is a great. I, I'm so proud of um, Robin Lee. She's done so much. Robin, I appreciate you coming on out tonight. Uh, in the words of Jay, you could have been anywhere in the world, but you chose to be here with us. We we appreciate that. Um, and you got it. And your new movie is is out. Um, please go see that. Yes, and and the sequel, the sequel, which it's hot. Now listen, is it, so the viewership's gonna get something out of this. They go see this movie. They're gonna. They're, oh yeah. They're gonna like it. They're gonna enjoy it. Yeah, women especially are going to are gonna love this. All right, now listen. Uh, I know that you're in this one, but I, I got to ask you: Is this one I, better than not, or equal to oh, the I, previous? I'm not naked. If that's no, 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 no. I'm not. Is no. It better than or equal to the, the last the, one? Yes. Is it better than or equal to? Is this a sequel? Sequel or is this like a you know? Well, I'm biased. So I'm gonna say this is better. It's better than. <laughs> then we're, I'm in it. we're gonna go with that. But um, you know what? It's it's totally enjoyable. It's sexy. It's lighter than the first one. They don't take themselves as seriously. There's a sense of humor. Um. The actors are more comfortable in their characters. They've been living in them for a while. It feels very natural and easy. I really think Jamie and Dakota do a beautiful, beautiful job. They've got a lovely, lovely chemistry. Um, 
our director, James Foley, did a, a great job in keeping it, like, sexy and fresh. And, and you know, most of the people who are seeing these um, movies have already read the books, and so they're expecting a certain thing. And so for him to keep there's some sort of mystery there and something to look forward to, you know what I mean? And, right. and, and some kind of new reveals and still make it enjoyable and live up to the book, but even better, I think he did a wonderful job. And so I'm, I'm happy. I'm happy with it. Robin, we appreciate you coming out. Um, we'd love to have you back uh, at some point. Um, hashtag Basement Flow is Real. My name is Dave Cavan. The lovely Robin Lee. We're here. God bless you. Thanks for tuning in. We'll holler back. Peace. Bye.